Uh, I know it's a crazy time. Uh, obviously, through the whole pandemic, uh, work's just slowly starting to come back. Um, even down here, because I'm I'm in New York City. Um, but uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's uh, um, it, with all the rule changes and the the procedures uh, and just the uncertainty. Um, you know, there's there's people have a lot of downtime, and I've had a lot of downtime myself, of course, over the summer. And um, I talked to a bunch of people in Buffalo, uh, some other friends here in the city. Uh, a couple of teachers, people that just teach film classes. Um, and uh, I, I realized between the volunteer groups and uh, the, the, the Syracuse people, Rochester people, um, that uh, the, the big thing about the, the industry, at least for myself, getting into it over the years, uh, is, is really just becoming familiar with the structure of sound for film. Um, and not just how to speak the, the language of it, but understanding the workflow and where sort of sound for films place under the sun is. Um, uh, Cause I, th I think once, once you start getting into that mindset and you start thinking like uh, somebody that does this for a living, um, uh, then you can sort of apply and, and scale up regardless of where you want to take it um, or whether or not you want to do it for a living. Uh, because uh, obviously this right here, what we're doing, what we're talking about here, this has sound, it's getting recorded, everything that you see, uh, here, even, uh, you know, just voiceovers, uh, uh, video games, applications, everything, you know, there's, there's, there's ways to apply these sort of ideas and um, the, the sort of mentality to making anything better. Um, so, uh, sweet, Kyle's here, Christy, sweet, awesome. Um, so I have two screens set up, uh, I'm going to be talking here, um, and then I have another screen, I'm going to show some clips, uh, we're just going to go through a little bit of how those kind of get broken down uh, on how to attack uh, a scene, you know, getting it from what's on paper, what you get at the beginning of the day, or hopefully ahead of time <laughs> with a shot list uh, and, and how to translate that uh, and, and apply what you might have, what tools you have, if any, at your disposal to, to get something clean. Um, so uh, of course, at any time, uh, if I, if I say something that people don't, uh, don't get, uh, or if it didn't elaborate enough, uh, I'm, Currently in the middle of doing uh, a show for HBO called Succession, uh, so some of my <laughs> my thought processes are might kind of trail off because I still have like work brain, uh, so I might miss a couple things. I have notes, so we'll see how it goes. Um, first off, uh, understanding like what sound for film is very briefly, and I'm 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 talking, I'm looking at a lot of professionals here right now. Anyway, um, but uh, for the vaguely uninitiated. Um, for some reason, uh, it's never audio, it's always sound. I don't know why that people just get that confused. I think uh, audio in the term of engineer has just been sequestered by the live and theater recording industry. Um, and it has a more uh, technical uh, building sort of background. Um, that's not to say that you don't end up doing quite a lot of building and tinkering yourself <laughs> um, in the film industry, uh, but for some reason, um, uh, they, they've the, that terminology is sort of reserved for that. So if we're looking at just the structure, what people, how you cre create and how you hire uh, sound people to, to make your movie, to do whatever you need to do, uh, this is how it sort of breaks down. So, um, and, and the largest of scales, uh, you have a feature film, you have a series, whatever it is, um, you're going to be looking at the, the, the two main, sometimes one main pre-production role uh, that is a supervisor or a designer. Um, and that person will probably be, uh, on the larger scales, it'll be a studio head. If not, it'll be uh, somebody that's connected with your uh, UPM or your, your producers or whatever company that is. It's usually a company person uh, that helps direct uh, the, the workflow of sound, identify things that you're going to want to do, uh, so to corral the kind of music involved in the film, uh, the, the scoring. They, they, they get a hold of composers. They, they get the, the studio time. They start looking at sound libraries, uh, they, they, they help sometimes organize uh, a mixer or the certain tools or musicians or things they're gonna need throughout the whole process. Um, uh, and they're pretty much reserved. That's usually like a studio style job or more or of an office-ish sort of job. It's not somebody that's really out in the field. But if you're, again, if we're looking at the credits and you wanna figure out who everybody is, that's, that's usually where they start with. Um, now, once once you get a bigger project going or or anything down to, you know, film with your friends on the weekends, 
you have a script that's ready to go, you have a production schedule, you have a UPM uh, manager, and you, you're like, hey, here's, I need somebody now to make this freaking thing. Um, oh, by the way, there's some swear words in the clips and things, it's the nature. Um, and I might swear a few times myself just for warning. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's been, it's the last show was a family show, but uh, this one is definitely not. So, mm. um, so let's say you get your script ready to go. Now you need a department, a sound department to actually make your film. Um, that's where you get into a production sound mixer. And the other person basically that shows up, um, usually during tech scouts, uh, and they're the ones that usually bring their own kit. Now here's an important point. Um, again, for the somewhat uninitiated, I keep looking at the familiar faces, so this will be like old news. Um, <laughs> but for most apartments, uh, a camera will rent stuff from a, a rental house, uh, a grip and electric house, a uh, prop house. You know, the, there's these institutions now, especially in, in Buffalo, there's some, some great people uh, that just kind of have all this stuff ready to go for different things, different needs. But for some reason, uh, sound apartment, sound mixers, uh, almost always tend to have their own equipment. Um, and it's, it's a combination of uh, their own personal tastes and resources and how uh, personally connected and, and aware they have to be of all their certain tools from top to bottom. Um, but also, you know, familiarity with people that they have to be able to rely on what they're used to. Um, and also the, the, the sort of uh, the, the trajectories that you can have over the course of your career and what the, that kind of gear you might want to be attuned to based on what's available in your market or uh, what you like doing uh, or what you, you find that you, you know, is the most available to you. Um, for instance, uh, <laughs> you know, when, when I started out, um, uh, I had uh, literally just a, a two channel Zoom recorder um, and I, I bought a used three channel mixer and a couple of used uh, microphones, uh, a couple of which I, th I think Adam now even has <laughs> the old uh, G ones, the Sennheiser G ones. Um, and it's just a, a stick with a mic on and everything was wired. Um, and I uh, was able to sort of co-op that uh, into some really irresponsible, you know, larger scale stuff that maybe, you know, had to kind of cobble together, but get away with, um, looking back on it now it would it just it still boggles me as to how i did it but um or how it even at least, at least sounded good um but yeah 10 10 years ago it was just just a little uh bunch of kit uh and we'll get into some of the more gear related things later um but so you you get your script ready you hire your mixer they're going to go in your tech scouts they're going to look at uh locations they're going to get with the other department see what kind of things you're going to run into they're going to be breaking down the script just like a dp breaks down a script um, and then they're going to give you an assessment of if that's the right kit for them, if they have all the tools that they need to do that job, if it seems like, you know, it might be suited somewhere else or somebody else where they need more people or whatever the, the budget is. Um, they'll have a boom operator. Um, and then they will hopefully, if the, if the budget allows for it, they'll have a utility. Uh, and that's, that's a standard uh, sound uh, kit for a team that shows up on a film. Now, a utility um, is kind of the, the, the gap filler, um, uh, depending on the project, let's say this one, for example, succession, most of my job is wiring the actors. Um, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of people talking at once and I'll show you the clip of it. Um, uh, but it's also uh, to do with uh, all the monitors for everybody on set that has to listen to all of the, uh, the, 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 the sync issues and, and getting everything to work with the cameras properly, the slates. So another thing, slates for some reason are also now the sound person saying it's a, uh, Danecki father time thing from the 90s I can talk about off to another time. Anyway, um, uh, so utility is kind of the go-between. Like obviously, a mixer like I'm right now, I'm sitting literally at my cart, and I'll, I'll flip it around a little bit and show you some of the stuff if you want. Um, the, uh, but they, they, they kind of grease all the gears, make everything work, but they also kind of have to be able to jump in to boom a scene uh, if they need additional booms. Uh, and especially nowadays with COVID, some, some crews run with four people, uh, just have two booms all the time, um, or two utilities. One person always stays with the actors just for contamination. But, um, but yeah, there's a handful of times where, you know, sometimes the train keeps going and the utility just has to, has to jump in and mix. So they have to know all the equipment, sometimes as good or better than the mixer, because um, of the different things that they might be running into. Um, uh, and, and kind of be able to handle everything else.
so uh, just thinking far ahead, um, you know, a, a person that is like me, that, that's a good tinkerer, that really good, loves gearhead stuff, um, and uh, kind of has a feel and some experience with everything else, utility is a great uh, career path because they're always in need. I've mixed a lot of films, I've boomed a lot of films, but for some reason I keep getting called as a utility for big jobs and, and I'll never complain. Um, so, uh, so that's a, a mixture in utility. The boom operator is, is sort of like a camera operator. They're the person that's the, the voice of the sound department on set. Uh, they're typically always, they always stay on set. Um, they're the ones that are working out the shots every time, just like a camera operator, uh, just like an onset dresser. Um, uh, just like uh, a best boy electric is the person that sort of uh, is the voice of the sound department and, and sort of gives what they need and what kind of feedback and things and tries to get, you know, get their, get their boom in place whenever they need and what they can and help negotiate with the other departments. Um, but they're sort of the, the eyes and, and, and mouthpiece of, of sound on a set. Um, and as we'll show in, in one of the clips, uh, sometimes it's, they're the whole show, just like a camera operator can be, you know, in a verite style shoot, you know, a lot of that creativity lies with them because they have to kind of craft a shot. So if you get a shot like we'll show later with, with two boom operators, it's it's an it's an intensely creative job because you have to kind of choose the right kind of microphones. Um, you know, it's, and again, it's part of a discussion with the mixer, but you know, it's uh, a good boom operator um, will will build enough trust and with enough knowledge with their own you know, ideas and, and a good relationship where they can kind of start to, to direct it on their own. Um, the, there's a fourth part here, uh, and it's a lot closer to the video department, uh, which I see uh, Jim Pepe is, he's, he's, he's muted on there. Well, I'll, 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 I'll dig him into this a little bit because he did work on Clover and he could probably say a couple things about it too. Um, but uh, there's a fourth part person part of this, which is in the third clip that I'll get to. Um, and that is, uh, a playback. Um, and again, this doesn't typically come up until you get into bigger, uh, more scaled up jobs and more uh, intricate jobs where you're dealing with musicians or bands or uh, elaborate uh, fight scenes of people who are yelling, screaming, performances, that sort of thing. Um, uh, but on the small scale, it's, you know, that's all really a music video is. If you're playing back, you know, audio and you're syncing it to the, the, uh, the camera, whatever they're doing, they're going to use that later. Um, but a lot of times uh, you're, you're pulling up things to, to cue at the right time to play the right dialogue or something that happens in a scene. Um, just like with, with video playback, you know, there's, there's stuff that happens all the time um, as, you're, <laughs> as you're watching something. I'm like, well, that's got to come from somewhere. And it doesn't necessarily fit the mixer's job because they're trying to get all the good dialogue. And that's not the boom operator because they're like a camera operator. They're just getting the shot. It's not really utility because they're, they got to be able to adjust things and fix things and kind of run around and set all the time. Um, so, uh, you know, again, on a smaller scale, sometimes a utility can do that playback job, uh, which I have done. And I'll show a clip from that. But it, it's, it's another sort of career path for the production world. Um, where between music videos and um, <laughs> the uh, performances and uh, musical numbers and movie musicals, um, where uh, you know that's it's it's an, a, you can't you just can't fathom doing a job without it um, because it'll sound like dirt. <laughs> um, so okay, you got your sound department, you, you make the movie, now you're getting into post. Um, you have uh, this is where your supervisor kind of comes back into play. Uh, the designer uh, will start, maybe they'll pop in with a composer or somebody on set once in a while. They'll, they'll, they'll send notes to the sound department and says, we need this. I want to make sure we get this recorded, this certain thing, this thing makes noise, or this person's playing this instrument. Let's get that isolated. Um, but sort of, you know, they'll, they'll uh, be sort of directing the workflow and then they'll be sort of uh, working with a number of different people in post to kind of uh, craft what they were given into something that you see just like an editor. Um, so the, uh, the, the designer uh, will sort of, or the supervisor or both, it can be two different things depending on how much music and, and soundtracking stuff and scoring stuff there is to do, um, or how much Foley and, and special effects and sounds that never existed before you have to make. Uh, they'll direct a number of people, uh, Foley artists that will create sounds in a stage. Uh, that's where all, that all comes into play. Uh, an editor that will take all the, the sound from the set, the diegetic sound or the dialogue um, and sort of chop that up and put them in the places and make it work with the way they want to cut the film. Uh, there'll be a re-recording mixer. 
um, that uh, in, the, in the ADR mixer, there's sort of parallel things. Some a lot of people do both, uh, where they will uh, take something that isn't as clean as they want it to be, uh, and they'll go to an actor and they'll play it in a studio for them to sort of reword with the similar microphone. Um, <laughs> I get calls sometimes still uh, uh, from jobs that I've done, or I know from my department. Uh, we'll say, hey, what scene, we, we don't have all of our notes, what scene was that, what microphone did you use? We're, in a, we're looping an artist, we're doing ADR looping. Uh, we want to use the same microphone to, to, to get it to match. Uh, and I'll just say, oh, well, it was this, it was here, and there it is. Um, so that's where, that's where ADR, uh, alternate dialogue recording, uh, or looping, uh, and the re-recording mixers come into play. Uh, and then once, once that's all done, you'll have the supervisor, designer, usually another uh, re-recording mixer, will come in and, and make a final mix with the director, just like a, an editor, once they get all their assistance and, the, and the, the raw done, they'll sit with the director and they will uh, hammer out something that hopefully doesn't sound like Tenet. Okay, good, I see laughter there, that's good. Um, <laughs> uh, which I'm happy to talk about, there's good and bad, and I think, you know, again, uh, yeah, that's a different, another day maybe. Um, so, uh, that's sort of the, uh, the overall uh, area, the, the world of sound and how that works. Um, anybody want to jump in anything to say? Okay, we're good before moving on. All right, no objections, uh, next order of business. Um, <clears throat> so uh, uh, a couple of major pieces of advice before we get into the actual like application um, uh, I talked about the, the, you know, growing the scaling of kit, uh, regardless of what you're doing. Um, the number one best piece of advice, regardless of what department you work in or, um, or what you're doing with yourself or you're making videos, even if you saw that, that silly little introduction video I made, um, I messed up. I mixed the microphone that I had on with the onboard camera audio and it's kind of sounded weird. It did sound a little too roomy. Um, and the reason is because I didn't have somebody monitoring. I was just talking into it and trying to play it back later and listen to it. And it was just into the phone and it was, and it was kind of hackneyed because I work on this stuff for a living. I don't really do camera stuff, uh, especially not with a phone. Um, so the, the best piece of advice for anybody is, while you're making something, uh, even if it's somebody that is, uh, you know, not really experienced, most people have a good idea of what sounds normal. So if you make that somebody's job, uh, having a friend, just put your headphones on the camera, whatever it is you're recording, so you can pay attention to the actors. If you're directing something, uh, if you're making a video yourself, um, if you have somebody else just to listen to it and you tell them, hey, this is what you're gonna be doing, don't care about anything else, just listen. I, I guarantee you, you will get something, you will get some better feedback, you will get some, somebody that says like, hey, uh, maybe that was wrong, you know, because when you're, when you're focused, and a lot of directors are focused, you know, especially in the bigger shows, um, you know, uh, you can't, get, you can't count on them to be so astute with the audio, and of course, you get, you know, levels of things, and you have to build a relationship of trust of what's going to work here and there, you might not get everything you need on the day, and that sort of take, um, uh, but if you have somebody, and this is kind of gets to the second thing, um, that uh, that you can trust to say, you know, this is this is good. We have it. We don't have it, uh, or you know, to to report those sort of things, regardless of what, how much money you have, regardless of how you're monitoring it, you know, just at the, the absolute basics. Um, then uh, you'll be able to fix those things on the day if you have time. You can make that decision then, rather than waiting till you you spend all your time and money. Uh, you know, energy, putting that, uh, committing that, and then not having the resources to fix it. Um, uh, that, that is hands down that will improve anybody's project, regardless of what it is. Uh, obviously, with COVID, it's kind of hard to do, having somebody else around. Um, but, uh, you know, if you're, if you're really that worried, uh, you know, about how a thing's going to come out, you know, commit yourself a little more time to sort of think about how the space is going to work and, and, and maybe, you know, run more audio tests and let yourself listen to something a few times before you, you commit to something. If, if you're on that sort of smaller scale and you don't have the help around, um, hands down, make it somebody's job. Uh, the second thing 
uh, is this more kind of a encapsulating the mindset of like what people that, like me to do this for a living? Um, when you get a piece of paper uh, that says, you know, here's what we're shooting this one day. Um, here's what these people are saying. Here's how many people, you know, this is, this is my big scene. This is my Oscar winning, whatever. Um, and you're recording dialogue This you want this to be your job. Your main task is really to just record the dialogue. Um, and, and it's a, the reason for that is a combination of, uh, yes, some things have to be diegetic. They have to happen on the day. They, they can't be redone. They can't be fixed anywhere else. Uh, but most things can, um, and uh, the performance, uh, especially human vocal performance uh, and eliminating or mitigating all those other things you have to deal with wardrobe and set deck and locations uh, and camera and lighting, getting microphones around. Um, all those things can be mitigated. But the one thing that, that is really can is kind of hardest to do uh, is is just the dialogue itself. Um, uh, you know, directors, actors will thank you if it comes out right, if they don't have to spend, the producers will thank you if they don't have to spend the money um, in, the, in the cost and, and, and risk of not getting things uh, right and reporting it right. Um, uh, the, the, other, you know, the other thing about the reporting um, uh, is, is way more than, than um, you know, speaking up, saying something on the day when it, when it doesn't work or making sure that you, you got that in, in as many different layered, isolated ways as possible. So uh, just starting to get into the meat and potatoes here. So right now I'm speaking into, let's take this out here. I'm speaking into a cement and it's wireless and it's all fancy. Um, and this is typically what you'd have on a set, uh, big sets, um, somebody running around with a stick and one of these guys. Um, but, uh, you know, we're going to get into some of the, again, some of the, the gears here, but um, you know, your, your, your shotgun's going to capture as much people that are happening close to screen or people that are talking next to each other and it's a bunch of different options. Um, but if you don't have enough tracks or if you don't think about adding a second channel or somebody walks away, um, you know, you're, you're stuck with that. You're married to that. And again, if you say that ahead of time, it's like, Hey, this is the tools that I have. You agree to this job. And then they say, you know, that you plan all that ahead of time, you know what you're getting into. They know what, what they're bringing by hiring you. That can all be worked out in a peaceful manner, and nobody's afraid to say, you know, this wasn't going to work, uh, this isn't going to work, you know, because they all talked about that beforehand. When you look at that piece of paper and say, I have these tools, I think I can do this, let's talk to the DP, let me see the shot list, how is this going to work out? Um, uh, you know, then we'll, the, the Clover Club's a good example, and again, you know, maybe we should get to those in a second. Um, but we're thinking in layers here, you know, obviously if somebody goes in the back of the room or you know you're going to have a bunch of people talking on the other side of the river or on a dock or something and you have to shoot from a boat, uh, hashtag night house, um, <laughs> then, uh, you know, you have to really kind of see those other options. Uh, so I have, let's see, oh, I'm going to make sure now I'm going to a wireless mic. Obviously, uh, you know, these a lot of these are designed to kind of, uh, match with each other and when you get a big leaves um, uh, but uh, you know the, again a lot of that can be adjusted because they're on separate channels um, I'll go let's see I'll do this I'll take this here and yeah I'll just I'll just use this so I can see what's going on here um, so I have a little board here there's my recorder uh, and my mix is kind of hot I'm gonna bring it down a little bit so I'm not burning your ears off. Um, yeah, but I have uh, a board with a bunch of channels and a bunch of wireless mics coming in. Um, uh, this is, you know, where I'd have basically as many people as I can as a handle or as many uh, uh, microphones as I can get my hands on for how many people that are in the shot. Um, and then I can have better control and then you have access to that later. Um, part of this whole thing is that what you're monitoring on the day, the, the, the job of a mixer on the day, um, beyond the mechanics is really to give an appropriate uh, mix of, of what the dialogue together should sound like at the end of the, at the end of the film. It's sort of a, a, a rough, not a rough draft, maybe sometimes depending on how it comes together and we'll see some of that. Uh, it may be the final product. I mean, just what they just push through. Like if you're doing a broadcast show where the turnaround is just four days, five days, they don't really have time <laughs> to go in and, and re-record everything. You know, those post jobs there, it's just sort of, okay, your mix is great, uh, now it's on air. Um, and the, the very shortest of which would be like news, 
people or people that what that did for years uh, up until seven, eight years ago uh, was you know, going on the field and recording something and I, mean, I got it and listened to it back maybe once and then it's on air. Um, uh, but having those options and, and, and being able to kind of bleed in between the two. And now I'm back saying, you know, going back to the, the shotgun here, you know, it, it, it's knowing where people are standing in the frame uh, and, and giving the director and the people listening on the day an accurate representation of what the sound is probably going to be like at, at, uh, when you watch a film. That's the real job of a, of a mixer. Uh, is understanding the layers and being able to deliver that and give people the confidence um, kind of closer, maybe like a DP, but also kind of closer to like a DIT uh, or a shader or somebody that is uh, helping translate how this is going to work and give people confidence to go home at the end of the day and not worry about their, you know, going home with a piece of crap. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, mentality wise, uh, another thing to keep in mind uh, is actually. Uh, it's the old Fox News slogan. I've been trying to figure out a better way to put it, but uh, if anyone remembers the old Fox News sl slogan was, we report, you decide. Uh, and this kind of gets into a more general attitude thing of just working in films and working on the assembly line of movies in general. Um, but if you think about all the stuff, you, all the crap you have to deal with on a, on a, on a daily basis and, and the priorities of, of a film and how the performance and the lighting and the cameras and, and the, the movement and the blocking and the props and the framing and all the other stuff has to go in, 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 into account. Um, you know, uh, trying to jump in there as, as, as any given department, let alone sound, especially when some of those things can be fixed or maybe not, um, and, and, and instead of assert yourself or decide for them what's good and what's not doesn't really help make the day. It doesn't help the assistant directors, you know, <laughs> turn the rest of the film out. It doesn't necessarily help the creatives unless they ask for it, unless they're kind of concerned about it. Um, so if you think about uh, you, that what you're collecting, you report what's going on. You say, oh, we had these, this error, this, this, this plane came through. Uh, hopefully everybody should know that. Uh, or this floor was creaky and we didn't address it. Um, even if it was just your fault and I say that a boom, you know, boom was in a shot or the boom was way off and we don't have it. You know, or this, we, we got one version of it and it's this take. You talk to the script, you talk to the director and you let them decide what to do about it. Um, the, again, the overall attitude about, you know, not taking anything personal on set really comes through and it's, it's an imperative part of the sound department um, because uh, of j just how, how quickly things can change and, 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 and their edit timelines and, and what they have to deal with later. Let them decide all of that. You do your job, you try to get as, be as best as you can and you report to them what happened and let them decide. So that's really the kind of the mentality thing. Um, uh, so to, to be big on that, the last thing really is to, again, just take notes um, stay organized. I mean, you don't have to go balls to the wall and keep everything in tiny little boxes. Um, but you know, most of a job, a sound department is tiny little parts, you know, little microphones. And I'll, I'll show you here in a little bit. Um, just uh, the mechanics of it, um, or, you know, really expensive things that can't get wet or dirty, um, or things you have to kind of keep, you know, <laughs> solid, but also stuff that has to be kind of on the elements and be able to take some wear and tear. Um, and on top of all that, it's usually going to be your stuff. I mean, if you get a few years into this, um, you know, starting from scratch, it's a huge investment. I mean, I started again with, with a thousand dollars, um, and you know, bought stuff, bought used stuff, which is great. And I'll, I'll put some of those resources up later because um, a lot of this stuff is designed to last. And if people that are reputable that take good care of it, you can buy, sell and trade and keep using this stuff over and over, hopefully for 20 years. I mean, there's a reason why the, the most abundantly used microphone, I mean, the, the, the seam here, the blue mic uh, is, uh, it's only, you know, it's 15 years old as a microphone and they're still being traded around, but the, the centers are 416. Gosh, Adam, what is that like? in the 80s, 90s that came up with that thing? I, I, I need a sip of coffee too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, I'm going to unmute myself here. That, that mic's been around since um, the 70s. Yeah. It's that's, that's about it, 50 years now that, that that's been the sound of the movies. Yeah, and it's, and yeah. it's, it's great that like, 
um, you know, you, you can build, uh, if, if you are organized and, and you have, keep good track of your stuff, you can, you can have a whole career based off of that, that one microphone. Um, Adam, you got, you got, I mean, you guys all the same stuff pretty much. I mean, the, the yeah, few, but, uh, key tools, you know, I don't want to take all your time. Yeah, but yeah, please, my, please. My origin story is very similar. I, I started with 2000 bucks. I bought a refurbished six channel mixer. It was a, a Tascam DR680. Um, I bought a, a 416 and, a, and an Audix SCX1 hypercardioid for indoors. And uh, that was my kit for, I'd say, my first year or so. I mean, fast forward to now, I walk around with 100 grand worth of stuff, as do you. Um, but we all started with next to nothing. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I still have those two mics, by the way. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, I, yeah. No, I've got, I've got mine here. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I rarely use the 416 anymore because, like, you know, I'm using the CMIT most of the time. And I, I almost never use those Audix mics anymore, although I, I have a couple of those, too. Mm. Um, I, I'm, I'm using the Chef's CMC indoors, which I, I think you're using a 50, but it, mm -hmm. it's very similar. Um, but if I had to, I could pick up those same old mics again today and go to work tomorrow with just those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, I mean, the, the idea that, you know, there, there's no one right way, there's no one specific piece of gear to use over time. Um, and there's, there's a lot of different ways to skin the cat. I mean, but and there's a lot of different ways to use those tools too. You know, um, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of uh, exciting though. The, the, the other way I used to put it is that sound is sort of like the, it's like the, we're like the Switzerland uh, of the film world where we can kind of, you know, the, the tools, yes, they can get very elaborate um, and very specific to you, the user, what you, how you feel and like to record things uh, and, and work your own personal workflow around. Um, but those tools can be applicable to almost any kind of production um, with, with, with some very strange limits. But, um, you know, the, the, the Adam and I, uh, you know, I, I, I'm doing utility now almost all the time, but, you know, we'll go from a, re, a reality show where we're chasing, you know, four people around with a bag on our shoulder, um, you know, through whatever, you know, dramatic situation and people fighting, you know, building something. Um, and then we'll go, you know, record a band somewhere, you know, playing out live or we'll go, you know, do a, an indie drama, somebody, you know, two people falling in love and then on the waterfall or something. I don't know. Um, you know, there's, there is really isn't that nearly the kind of limit to uh, the way you can build uh, your resources, the, the way that most other departments are or the, your, your repertoire, really. I mean, there's, there's a lot of the, your reputation, what you might get uh, as far as what you, what you excel at, where you have excelled at that might kind of direct uh, you in, in the way that kind of like a stream would carry you in different directions. But um, if there's something you really like doing, you know, most of the gear will kind of apply. Uh, and that's, that's kind of one of the great upsides to just sound department in general. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, I want to kind of go through, um, we talked about the career stuff, uh, talked about some of the attitude stuff. So, uh, who wants to watch some clips and figure out how this really works for real, real? Okay. Hands up. Great. Hey, look, it's only 40 minutes in. Talk my ear off. All right. So I pulled up a couple clips here and I have, I'm a, a two versions here. I'm going to everyone look at my nice, stupid ear monitors. Um, uh, so I have, uh, I have three clips. Um, I want to kind of break down and again if this is posted later uh, it might have to get blurred out or cut out um, uh, but uh, uh, things that I'd work on specifically to kind of exercise uh, this sort of uh, again some of the mentality things you have to think about and sort of really describe the specific roles uh, in a practical way uh, that, that you can uh, sort of get, wrap your head around when you're watching something uh, or when you're looking through those credits. Um, so the first one is actually from Succession. Um, uh, it was an episode. I worked on a couple episodes uh, last season, and I'm currently doing the next one right now. I mean, it's, 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 people know. Um, uh, but uh, this is, uh, well, let me just play it, and then we'll kind of talk a little bit about it afterwards.
So, uh, pretty wild. Um, so just a couple of things to think about ahead of time. If you're, if you, if you, if we weren't able to piece, piece it together, that whole thing was done, uh, largely as one shot. It was done with three cameras on zoom lenses, uh, and they wanted to capture it all at once. Um, uh, so, uh, when we, when we show up to, uh, that amusement park, uh, on top of all the regular, you know, sound location, you know, things we have to mitigate, um, which being, you know, the roller coaster, all right, you got to time that right. So it, it, you see it in the background, go at the very top, and then you want it to go away and never come back. Uh, so that was, it was a bit, a bit of a, uh, you know, discussion first, because that's going to ruin any take where else where you kind of move, if you do have to edit around. Um, and then you, we, obviously you see crowds in the background, right? Um, you have to, you know, again, have a bunch of background actors and an AD team that can talk to them and you kind of you know, you, a, a sound, you said, say, okay, they're going to, they're going to say stuff at the beginning and kind of quiet down a pantomime and be there in the background. Um, uh, but, uh, then you start to see a rehearsal and you see how it looks and you see maybe this, 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 this gosh, this big ass wide camera up here. Um, and you have different cameras working at different times. You know, and you and and they want to be able to be free and 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 hear the shot themselves. So everybody's listening to all the dialogue all at once, and they want to be able to kind of change who they're looking at because there's one there's one shot there where they're looking at at uh, uh, at, at Shiv and, and Tom, the, the the couple there eating the popcorn, and then you know on their own volition with with no uh, forewarning, they just kind of go to the other group of people. Where in an edit, they'll be like, okay, we do that part, and then we cut, we cut away and do this part. But without having that, literally everybody had to be wired because we can't get a boom in there. We can't follow them around because it's any camera can be any shot any time. So that's a situation where if you have that kind of conversation ahead of time, you know, and again, success in, in general, it's a show where everybody's wired. I'm, I'm doing up to like 10, 12 people a day at once. Uh, and sometimes uh, tandem mixing, <laughs> where we have so many people that there's just not enough fingers on a board to mix all of it. So you need a second person. I'll come in and I'll bring the other card in. I have all the same gear. It works out. Um, and we just add channels and fingers. Um, but uh, the one fun bit there is there is one line of that whole thing. Adam might get it because he's a pro. There was one line out of that whole thing that was in a boom. Does anybody want to wager a guess as to which one it was? All right. No, no answers. Okay. Um, so uh, the one line <laughs> was on the hug. And that's another thing that you kind of have to be able to think about is like, oh, if I'm going to wire everybody, and I'll show everybody right now. Um, and so I'm wearing a wire. There we go. Uh, and it's obviously, it's a, it's a little, it's not a little different, but if you're in a bigger space and you're opening up and you're speaking loudly enough, uh, it's, you know, you, you can capture a good enough sound and you mix a little bit let's say let's mix a little bit of the, the boom sound in with it. So it sounds a little more natural, right? So you get a little bit of that space. Um, but I'm actually wearing, if I talk right down into it, I'm actually wearing a wire right there. So you guys can hear it now. I'll take the boom out. And, so it. and you know, every single one of these actors is just going to be wearing something, hopefully under the clothes. And that's, you know, as a utility, um, and sometimes mixers do it too in smaller things. Um, that's a big part of my job is, is helping people understand, um, you know, helping and talking with wardrobe and seeing what everybody's wearing in every shot, uh, in every scene, to sort of work out how, and there's a whole big, I mean, there's a, hey, I'll show you. I mean, I, I carry this, you know, <laughs> close it up and carry it to every, every green room, every set. Uh, because that's, you know, that's, it's a big uh, part of the process is, is learning literally every kind of wardrobe and how to deal with, with hiding a microphone on somebody. Uh, cause you, you, sometimes you won't know until you get to that scene that day. And hopefully if there's something really tricky, you're, if you see in the script that somebody's wearing, you know, next to nothing, or the one time I've had to mic a stripper, um, who was naked, uh, <laughs> you know, the, <laughs> most of the time it's, it's just going to be some, uh, a random uh, wardrobe or coat or shirt or something you're going to have to work around. So coming prepared and trying to get all that and talking into wardrobe ahead of time. Great. But sometimes you just have to be able to uh, attack anything. It just then comes with, with time and practice. And if you, if you, even if you have just a basic wired microphone at home, you can, you know, we talk about tips or something later, email me, whatever. And, and I'll show, I'll show you some of the resources too. a lot of great companies and videos and how to's and things on, on, on YouTube on how to deal with different ways of different things. And, 
Uh, if you're not sure, you can always look it up and ask somebody. Uh, if you're in Buffalo or anywhere, you know, Adam, I'm sure loves, uh, you know, coffee and, and Tim Hortons. Uh, <laughs> he'll, he'll answer your questions. And, uh, and there's, there's a couple of people across Western New York uh, that are, are great resources. And that's, that's, I'll get into the very last thing as far as like where to go from here. But, um, uh, you know, just ask somebody a question. You buy them coffee. They, they will, will talk, especially now that I've had like five cups. Uh, <laughs> we'll keep talking our ears off. Um, but uh, uh, the, the other thing to really kind of mention about uh, a, a scene like that is um, the, the, the negotiation comes uh, from when you know, like, you, again, we're dealing with a kid. So uh, we've got a couple of kids in this scene. We know it's going to be hard to get them back. It's going to be hard to recreate an outside kind of voice if we have to loop that and play it again later. Um, so uh, I said, okay, well, uh, we got somebody that's hugging. It's going to be really hard if we put a mic here. We're going to have to move it somewhere else. Maybe put a second mic on them after the hug just for that one line because it's a kid. And it's going to be hard to get them back because they're only in that one scene for that one day. Um, and worst case scenario, we'll have them, well, you know, maybe uh, we'll get that line wild after the fact. Um, and again, it's, it's another thinking ahead. We don't have it. We don't have it. You let them decide what they want to do with it. Um, so that's really kind of the job of, of, of the mixer is to try and give them an appropriateness of what the camera is seeing, you know, maybe put them in the background, the people in the background will be still there. Um, but it's, it's pretty wild if you see just the show or some of the stuff like that in general where, uh, wow, everybody really is being recorded and they're all able to have the freedom to kind of move around like that. That's what gives it the right, the special kind of feel. Um, so that's really kind of the, the mixer's job is to give them, you know, what would sound appropriate at the end of the day. Um, so we're going to go on to uh, a great example of, of uh, what it's like to be a boom operator um, and what it's like to not just do an indie, but kind of come up with something really great um, with, you know, the, the 10 years ago kit, you know, the, the thousand dollar kit um, and how you can apply it. And if you get the right circumstance, you can make something really great out of it. Uh, and this one is actually from a Buffalo film. This was Clover. Um, that we did, gosh, three years ago now, I think. Uh, and I'm gonna get, I'm gonna force Pepe to talk a little bit about it too, because uh, I know he was there doing video. All right. Um, so, uh, and again, uh, anyone besides Adam, so he'll know this. Um, <clears throat> Uh, want to guess uh, how many microphones we did that scene with? How many wires? How many booms? All right. Anyway, um, so that entire scene, obviously, it's Steadicam. Uh, we got pretty lucky because uh, they know they wanted to keep it kind of Tarantino style. We're kind of moving around a lot, which is a pretty low headroom. Um, you know, able to get booms in there, but there's a lot of soft light. There's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of action stuff moving around. So it was, it was a really tough situation to wire people. Uh, this is where uh, Aaron Austin and I uh, were uh, both boom ops for a guy named Felix Andrew. Um, and we all looked at it and we said, we can do this, just Aaron and I. Um, and so we worked out with the Steadicam operator what they kind of were trying to do with these shots uh, and kind of keep it constantly moving around left and right. Um, and so we just did the entire scene with two MKH fifties. Um, so again, if you're, if you're thinking, you know, how do I, how do I do this with, with no money? Um, if you have that kind of talk and negotiation or if you're producing it yourself uh, and you have a couple of decent indoor microphones, the, the, the audixes or, um, or the deities, I know they're making them uh, for indoor style now or the capsules. Um, you can get a very similar sound out of that if you have operators that can work out and, and know the, the, you know, how to stay out of the shadows and reflections. Uh, and they can work out a zone defense of the dialogue of people talking back and forth at the right time and how to kind of crisscross if you got two people over here versus two people over here or back and forth while the camera's kind of moving around. You make out all this dance. Gosh, I wish. Pepe could probably talk about it. Um, seeing 
you know, three people, you know, with two sticks and a camera just kind of walking around this room while main, trying to maintain being as silent, silent as possible. Um, uh, you know, it's, it was, it was kind of a crazy feat on the day, but it's possible. And it's, it's, and that's kind of the job of a boom operator is to have those discussions. What's the framing going to be like, what's the stuff going to be like, uh, uh, Pepe, what, you know, uh, if we're getting into the, the video side of this, obviously it's a steady cam, so you can't cable anything. Uh, so, so you just, I mean, for that kind of shot like that, can you just walk us through a little bit of like what the, the video workflow for that would be? Well, for for that specific shot, that was uh, entirely difficult. We were, I believe, on a second floor apartment in Buffalo, which wasn't very large. And I remember uh, something like 20 people crammed into a small bedroom. Just, you know, everybody, director, DP, uh, hair and makeup. And of course, I have one little monitor to try to watch this all back on. So obviously something that would absolutely never happen right now. <laughs> of course. Not yeah. um, you know, the, the biggest problem in that apartment was uh, terror deck line of sight and all of the uh, interference with all of the other wireless. Because um, I had to continually move the receiver behind the wall while that shot was happening just to keep you know, image up for um, playback purposes. Uh, yeah, that's, I mean, that's another thing I haven't even really touched on is just the, the, the whole RF spectrum and, and understanding some of the, the engineering and, and, and uh, the, the science behind all of that and how to get it all to play together. It's another big thing with utilities. Um, but, uh, you know, if you're on location, um, you know, you have to really consider um, you know, how people are going to be able to watch this sort of thing, how they're going to be able to listen to it. Um, you know, how, how are you going to communicate, especially now with COVID, how can you communicate with people that you can't be anywhere near? Um, or, you know, how are you going to work out um, ahead of time how to get uh, video to directors and audio to, to those people um, all set? And that's, that's kind of really where the mechanics of that is, is where our department comes into play uh, and, and where we can work together. Um, because, you know, there's, uh, between the, the, the Teradex and, the, uh, the, the signal pass and some of the stuff that we use on the same spectrum, uh, and, and the positioning of our, of our recording equipment can sort of, we can negotiate some of that and, and relay some of that, and help each other out. Um, and there was a few times on that, on that job where, you know, uh, because of the, the video capabilities or the sound capabilities, one of us had to be really close or one of us had to be far away where we would use uh, the sound cart to, to run the video through because there's, you know, recorders on, on, on or there's monitors on our cart too. And we would use that as, as a junction, as a jumper to go out to, to Pepe downstairs or, or somewhere else or vice versa. You know, if we needed to get video uh, or, or run cables or run audio through, we would go to him first and kind of line that up. So it's a, it's an interesting kind of, uh, you know, uh, fraternal sort of department. Uh, and working with the workflow of, of, of video. And of course, you know, again, there's a lot of crossover with, with playback as well. Um, especially when you have uh, VFX or music or musicals uh, or performances that you, you can't really see at the time. There's a lot of stuff going on, you know, multiple cameras doing 710 splits or, you know, people, two, two cameras shoot different things, you know, where you can't, you don't have enough eyeballs to see what you're filming all the time. Um, uh, definitely not that kind of scene, but that's, you know, that's, that's part of a big part of the job. Um, so let's, let's go on to the third clip here. Uh, and this will be mostly for I, like the, sorry, what? Sorry to interrupt before you move on. Yeah. Um, can I just add something? This, this yeah, yeah, please. Booming. Um, a shot like that, which uh, I, I was almost thinking you were going to say it was on one mic uh, until you pointed out the, the lights, but. Yeah, um, you could. I mean, there's some zone defense yeah. there, but yeah, you, it's potential yeah. to do that on one mic. The, sh the reason that shot worked is because you and the other boom up and the steady cam up all knew what you were doing and your pros. And this emphasizes why you cannot just hand a boom to a college intern <laughs> and, uh, you know, some kid who, who's never worked a job other than McDonald's before and anybody can hold a pole, right? Uh, no, <laughs> it if you were not as good as you are, that never would have worked. 
And I, I think we've all done, we've all encountered shots similar to that before. You need, the, the boom op has to be somebody who knows what they're doing. And as a, as a sound mixer on indie films, I've run into this more times than I like to think about enough to count where they do just, you know, it's, it's the director's cousin's kid who needed a summer job and boom sound for the whole movie is unusable. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's, uh, it, it's, it comes back to that sort of, you know, make, makes, make it somebody's job. You know, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, I've, I've been handed green people. I've been green myself with other people. Um, and you know, when, even if you don't have somebody that you built up that, that kind of trust, like we have gotten even on jobs before where I can, yeah. I can trust you. You can get that shot. Adam can tell me what he can do, what he can't do. What's not going to work and not work. And I'll just let him do it. Um, but if you get somebody that has absolutely no idea, if you don't have that time to walk them through every shot and be that person and, and to, to make those kind of judgment calls as a good boom up would do, uh, you know, they, they're not going to, they're never going to know how to do it themselves. You know, it's the kind of thing where, you have to you have to spend uh, you know uh, time uh, working under people, observing maybe even other departments. And this gets into some of the career things too about like how to get to this point uh, where you are maybe working as PA or in locations and, and locking up and seeing uh, the communications and hearing some of the communications between these people and how they negotiate that stuff and, and seeing how it gets played out. Uh, until you know how to do that, you, you really have to be just human furniture. That's the best you can hope for. Um, and, and, and with, with sometimes, you know, disastrous results, if it's not really planned out well, um, that's a, it's an excellent point to bring up. Um, uh, yeah. And it just, it, a, a subtle and you know, not so subtle nod for people trying to do their own thing, you know, <laughs> or just people that think they can, they, 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 it's not important or they can put anybody in that role. Um, like I said, it's, it's like a camera operator. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's somebody that is, is creatively crafting the, 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 the shot. And if you don't have it, you don't have it. Uh, and again, if you, if no one's reporting that that's your only source and you don't have it, then, you know, then, then you're going to end up pulling your hair out at the end of the day. Uh, and hopefully not end up, you're going to end up, you know, not like Adam and I with luscious long hair. <laughs> um, so let's, let's move on to the third clip. This is, uh, this is to do with, um, this gets into some of the, the musical utility playback stuff we're talking about. Um, and uh, again, I'll, I'll, I'll play it up here and I'll just kind of go over uh, exactly uh, kind of how this sort of thing is done um, in, in the biz. All right. Uh, so obviously, you know, what we're, what we're hearing and seeing there is, uh, uh, it's, it's obviously the song. Yes. Uh, but it's also very obviously the people actually singing, uh, on set and it's their real voices recorded on the day and there's real people clapping along and they're cutting around to different people and they're all doing it in time. Uh, and it all, and it all works. You, you, you feel, you hear the real song. Um, and it, and it almost, it's, it's, it's very, it's almost like it borders on, uh, uh, it's it's like it's just added after the fact. So, um, uh, when that shows up in a script uh, and it says, you know, these guys sing the song, well, immediately we have that discussion. Uh, and this was done. Uh, I did this last year uh, in the winter, um, and uh, it was Anton. It was Anton's job. Um, and uh, oh, uh, Xander. Uh, Xander Metz is, was his uh, boom up. Uh, so, uh, I was on break and, uh, they needed, uh, basically somebody to come in, uh, and handle the playback of the song. Well, okay. Yeah. It's on, you see, we're doing the song. Well, it's a little more complicated than that because we want to hear their voices. So when you see that, you have that discussion, you say, oh, we want to be able to record their voices. We want to be able to cut around and see people laughing and, and, you know, clapping along in the same time. Um, but we want to make sure they can, that they're singing and, 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 and they're, they're doing it in time with the real song. Well, how do you do that? Um, well, on top of everybody monitoring, uh, it's one of the, the common resources things called Comtech is a company that, that made assistive uh, listening devices for, for theatrical stuff for venues for a long time. Uh, they realized there's a super durable uh, method uh, that uses a lower part of the U.S. spectrum that doesn't 
the RF spectrum doesn't interfere with anything else or people can monitor audio. Um, and they also make tiny, tiny, tiny little ones that will fit in your ear, They're commonly called earwigs. Um, so for that scene, they'll call somebody up like me or somebody else and they'll go rent a couple of earwigs because they're freaking expensive um, <laughs> and they're hard to service. Um, and uh, they'll say, how many people need to sing? Well, it's just two. Okay, great. So uh, I'll have the song queued up and I'll have a little mixing board where uh, I can play a little bit of the song for everybody out of a speaker on set. Uh, and I can keep the song playing in their ears, just their ears, and you never really see it, especially with Cat Williams because it's long hair. Um, and so they can sing along on set, and all you're recording in the, with the booms and their lavaliers on the set is just their voice. Uh, but all your the the all what you're hearing on set is is not the song itself that just goes uh, onto an ISO track they can use later. But how do we deal with all the people that want to clap along, right? Because if it's just them up in there, you know, they're singing, how does everyone follow? Well, what we do is, and this happens for, for club scenes, for music venues, for bands all the time, uh, for dances, um, is uh, I'll have a little EQ board there and I'll have the song playing on an ISO track that just plays. Uh, but for some of the scene, what I'll do is I'll, I'll EQ literally everything but just the very bass. So it's called a thump track or uh, just a subwoofer track or where I'll EQ everything else out. So all you hear is a very low frequencies and a beat and a rhythm that kind of moves the thing along. Kind of wish I had that <laughs> built ready for day because it's kind of cool. Um, but uh, that is, that's for almost all music video stuff where we hear like musical stuff. That's, that's how it's done. Uh, and again, there's people that can make a whole career out of that, which is cool. Um, Cause they, they always, it's always needed. Um, but this stuff is, it's kind of specific, but it still falls into the realm of utility and playback. Um, so that's, that's sort of the best kind of examples I come up with recently uh, for you know, the things you kind of run into and how the whole sort of system there works. Uh, there's the super fun show, by the way, they're like really cool dudes. Uh, so I guess at this point, I mean, I have a bunch of other things here. Um, I mean, I, I guess I could probably throw them into the chat if you guys want it on there, or I could just put it up on the screen. Um, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, as far as resources, but um, uh, just uh, general tips. Um, like I said, you know, you're you're just not on on uh, on how to, uh, and I'm not just on my job or my department, but um, what gets you kind of more work what keeps, keeps me coming back with some of these same people like the succession people uh or or working a couple of times i did the night house with anton um and keep getting you know making networking and getting called back um uh, a lot of it is this sort of uh you know not again not taking anything personally learning how to work knowing your place under the sun uh, and and being flexible while being able to honestly report and say when something is working or it's not and, and let them sort of decide um, what do we want to do with it. Um, so I guess uh, for the time being, I guess if anybody else has any sort of specific questions on stuff that I've already gone over um, or just in sound in general, um, if not, I can start throwing out, uh, you know, further readings, resources, and other stuff for, uh, for folks to get their hands on. See, is that Jim Pepe there with his hand up? Yes, it is. So, uh, so I don't have a uh, film audio background. I did or still continually do live event audio. Um, so everything in that aspect is left, right. My question is when you're filming dialogue with multiple microphones, are you recording on a, a channel by channel basis or is it getting submixed down to a left right and then getting edited that way uh the answer is yes <laughs> um so i'll uh, briefly i'll just take this around here and i'll show you again and so we're very closely here it's gonna be a little bright um but uh on here we have uh the first channel on my recorder it can go i think up to 12 on my nomad um uh, it's always going to be a uh, mono mix um, and sometimes they'll, they'll even have a stereo mix or stereo tracks if there's certain things like that. Um, 
Um, but that will be basically, like I said before, like what the approximation of what it should kind of sound like, mostly with the dialogue on the day um, uh, for, for the edit and how those sort of wires and different microphones come together. But after that mono mix, uh, there is any number of individual channels that you record uh, uh, separate or isolated ISO tracks is what they're typically called, um, and those basically are your your backups. And so it's it, regardless of what hands you move left and right, up and down, um, those will have a certain amount of uh, gain that's that's audible uh, that they can use and kind of adjust later. And now, especially with with with, uh, with technology, um, they can do a lot with the the noise floor and kind of adjusting and, and re-recording again. That's where those post jobs come into play. Uh, is taking those things if they want to go to somebody uh, else versus another if they if they completely if they hate your mix and they want to just redo it they can do that um, so uh, so yeah the, the the overall answer is yes there's always there's always a mix because not just for the for the edit for the dailies but that's that's for, for what they want to be able to hear and you know trying to send out stereo signals to everybody is kind of silly most of the time uh so it's almost always a mono mix that'll go out to the context goes to the earwigs goes to the director goes to you uh <laughs> um but then uh, you know following right behind there uh will be a you know a cavalcade of how many other tracks you're using whether it's other microphones or lavaliers or plant microphones which are great i was, I was considering another couple of things with with car scenes uh that's another big thing is how do you you know there's all kinds of different decisions to make as far as whether you put something on a person or in a car based on what they're doing and something like that, where they're sitting around the table, if they're sitting and eating and drinking and, and trying to do it with a lavalier, well, it's just going to sound like, you know, it's just going to sound like they're, you know, they're talking and chewing and doing it's going to sound like a mess where you prefer to use something on a boom or if I'm doing the same thing, you don't, you don't hear. It. Um, so you, you, you kind of, you throw, you, some people, you know, that you know, they throw everything at the mix don't necessarily have to, especially if you're good uh, and you can really you take good notes and you can see the different dialogue and different people speaking and you kind of work the different levels as you need to. Or you have a, a great shot like that thing in Clover. A lot of the stuff from Emily, uh, and it's another important thing here, uh, even though that was, I think, we, again, the first, uh, you know, million-ish, I don't know, half a million, whatever they did with, with, uh, with Emily, um, but with, with Adam, uh, we came, the, the producer came back to me later and uh, said there was no ADR with kids. Um, and that's just, a, you know, it's a, it's a testament to, you know, again, having those conversations, working that out. Um, and when something doesn't work, say, hey, we don't have it and, and talk that stuff out um, uh, to have that, uh, you know, to have that all work is, is, is great. It can happen. Um, uh, so yes, that's uh, hopefully a good answer to your question there. Um, and, oh, there's a chat thing. Look at that. Uh, oh, uh, Brayton, uh, what are some things an actor can do to make the sound record his job easier? Oh, great. Um, so, uh, actors are, uh, the, the, the most crude term for actor is human furniture. Um, <laughs> that I have heard, uh, and uh, obviously, you know, you have, a, they have a very specific job to do. Um, you are, uh, you're, you know, tr you're trying to give your performance, you're trying to do it, um, you know, you, you're trying to <laughs> work through everything you want to do in different ways. Um, uh, you know, you're working with a director, you have that connection and you're in the moment you're, or your method and, and you, know, you have to do something that your character does. Um, uh, but uh, being receptive uh, and, and, and listening and, um, again, some of it depends on, on the mixer or the situation and what you may or may not be required to do, uh, but being open to saying, uh, to, to taking feedback after a take. Uh, typically, um, on, on, uh, on, on a larger scale, uh, and from, from the sound department, you want to uh, permit people to do it things as naturally as possible, at least the first time out. Uh, and then if something really isn't working, then you can, then the sound will either go to the AD and say, hey, that dude was talking back there, he didn't need to. Um, <laughs> or uh, you'll go to uh, the, the wardrobe and say, hey, can, can we go with the actor and like have them not zip this up or do something that's going to mess with a lavalier. Uh, or you'll talk to the actor directly and like, hey, you know, like, um, or you talk with the director and the actor 
and you have that conversation about the shot and like, Hey, this is a really, you know, wide shot here, or it's the, even though we're back here, it's a really long lens and it's a close up. Can you, you know, is there anything you can do to project more or, you know, to, to, to give us this thing that'll help the sound? Uh, you know, there's, there's any number of situations that can happen, but if an actor is not receptive to any of that, they don't have to come with their own ideas and, and they don't have to ask if this is good or not because they'll just do the thing and that's fine. Um, but um, uh, being, o being open to that um, really allows, uh, you know, the, a, a, a better free flow, uh, a better product at the end of the day uh, overall. Um, uh, some people for gosh, any given reason, you know, they, they don't budge on some of that stuff and, and that can work and that's okay. Um, but again, it's, it's a conversation. Uh, being able to have the conversation is, is key and being uh, receptive and open to that. Uh, that's, that's for me, that's the biggest benefit. And, and the actors that I've come across where I can approach them uh, in, in a scene and say, Hey, um, you know, can I, can I adjust your microphone? Uh, can I fix something or can, uh, can, can you not be, you know, like grabbing yourself or touching your chest or, or sitting down here for this one, for this one, or we have it this way. Um, that's, that's really big help. Uh, oh, great. More stuff. Uh, a lot of micro budget films, one-on-one -on -one person sound crew, which means this person has to operate the booming acute track of levels on a recorder. Okay. Um, uh, well, uh, Mitchell, uh, uh, the, the first thing, uh, I can probably tell you is to, um, again, um, even though you have to be the boom operator and the mixer, uh, make listening somebody else's job, uh, have somebody else that's at least monitoring, um, that is, uh, you know, whether it's a, <laughs> whether it's a PA, um, if you don't have the kind of resources, um, you know, uh, just start hopefully, you know, finding a friend or somebody that you can kind of work through and help on that, um, uh, worst case scenario, um, you know, find another sound mixer, somebody that you can get some practical tips from, um, um, or just be able to uh, walk around and practice, you know, follow people. It seems creepy, but, you know, set up with your friends around your house or even, um, and, and kind of go through, uh, let's say you get a script, for example, that says, you know, uh, it's to, it's to, it's a person going about their day. They wake up to get out of bed to go to the kitchen, whatever it is. Um, uh, or you, you have somebody driving a car, they get out, they talk to somebody else to go. Uh, if it's something you really haven't gotten into before and you know you have to do it alone, um, uh, you know, and, and you, you've signed on to this, you said, okay, like I attacked the script and here's, I have this kit that'll work for it. And these many people are speaking and I think I can do this. Um, uh, and, and you think it's, it's worthy as a career investment. Uh, you think it's a good opportunity, which is a kind of a different discussion we can certainly have. Um, you know, there, there are limits to that sort of thing. Um, but once you've already decided all that and you, you've, you know, you bit the bullet and you're on the job and that's your, it's your responsibility. Um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with, with practicing, with, with creating that scenario in your own time, uh, and walking through it and then just recording somebody else, somebody doing sort of the same thing. Um, or if they're doing rehearsals, gosh, this is great. And if you have the time and it's, and it's something, you know, even if they can't it definitely can't afford to pay you for it, they're definitely going to be doing rehearsals. Uh, and if it's just you ask to come to the rehearsal, you know, and see if they're going to be in a space, just doing it, going over it. And you can just record it yourself. So you can at least hear it back a couple of times before it costs a lot of money to do it on the day. Um, that's probably the best advice. Um, uh, and, uh, again, over time, obviously having somebody else move a microphone for you is, is the best thing. But if you don't have that all the time, especially with COVID, um, you know, uh, practicing, understanding with somebody else um, how that microphone works, um, what kind of pickup pattern it has, uh, what it likes to do in different environments, um, and being able to record a bunch of stuff and listen to it back and, 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 and know what you're getting into um, and, and know what your what tools and how to mitigate the things that your tools can and can't do um i hope that's a good start and if not you can you can definitely again you know buy adam some coffee um you know send me a garbage plate uh anything uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll 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 do everything we can to to uh to help try and make them better um uh i'm gonna start throwing some stuff into the chat here um uh just as far as uh, 
uh, further uh, further reading in general. Um, uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna dump a bunch of links here. Uh, my fingers can work it. No. There we go. You'd think I would know how to use this, right? Hey, look at that. Um, so uh, if this is something in at all that you think you might want to do with yourself be, beyond, you know, uh, you know, uh, taking your free time with w literally whatever gear that you have, whether it's just, whether it's just a, a what I got sitting around here. Um, you know, if it's literally just a stick mic or a studio mic um, that you have on a, on, a, on, a, on a broom pole, not a boom pole, or if you, if you have a basic road kit or wireless kit or something and you can just practice in your free time. Um, if you really want to start to do, do this for a living and you have literally nothing or a basic, you know, $500 kit, whatever it is, if you put your, and this is kind of how I got started too, because I came from the news world and did music and theater and stuff for many years. Um, in I think 20, 2010, um, I, I finally bought a little bit of kit and I was with the, uh, I started getting involved with friends and these people uh, called RMM, which is now Rothfuss. It's like a volunteer group in Rochester. Um, and a lot of people want to make stuff on their own. Um, and uh, I said, hey, I got, I, I'm working a, a TV station job. I got my weekends free. Anybody wants to make stuff on the weekend, I need practice. I'll come record it. You know, that's, and it's, and it's fun. I learned something different every time. And they know because I'm not getting paid, it might not be great. You might have to do a few takes. It might mess up, but it's great practice. Um, and uh, I spent most of that year on my weekends just making people stuff. I dedicated like 20 shorts over the course of, course of the year. Um, some of them came out great. Some didn't. Um, but by the end of it, I was, you know, I could start to see the same kind of shots and characters and things and the ways to use the tools in the same way. So I didn't have to worry about every single take. I knew kind of what I was getting into. So, um, for, for, for those, uh, sort of weekends and, and things in your free time, uh, if you want to know sort of, uh, where the next steps are how to get into it, how to look at, you know, what the rest of the gear, what are the options of things that might be available to you. Uh, so we have a, a bunch of links here. Um, I know it's Facebook and it's, it is what it is. Um, but there is a ton of great groups. Um, and some of them, even Adam and I are active on, um, just exchanging ideas and, and, uh, you know, techniques, uh, and different products and things. Um, the uh, JW Sound has been like the the, the old timers uh, web group that was from a, a, a Jeff Wexler um, from uh, from the '90s. You know, one of the major LA guys um, has had this web page, this forum, and I know it's, it's also on Facebook or the Location Sound Facebook. Um, or like we were talking about, like you know how stuff lasts for a long time. If you can vet somebody, they know it looks clean, it's kept up well, and it's not a forgery as some Sennheiser stuff has started to be from China. Um, and you know this, what's good, there's a location used by, a uh, location sound used by and sell, it's really good. Sometimes you'll find stuff on the brand's Facebook pages people will send to get rid of. I mean, I've been a Zaxcom user for a few years now, um, and it's a really good tight-knit group because they're still smaller of a company, but um, stuff gets bought and sold and traded around there. I mean, most of my stuff came from other people. Um, and now with the new kind of recorders that are coming out, which I'll also post here in a minute, um, there, there's, there's a great market for some of this stuff that is still rock solid. It just might not have the certain bells and whistles that some of the new majors and series people are looking for. Um, the, the, the brand websites, the brand forums, uh, the, the brand festival pages, but also uh, Gotham and True, T-R-E-W. Uh, it's Gotham Sound in New York and Atlanta. Uh, and True, which is in Nashville and Atlanta and Toronto, um, more, most recently in Toronto, I think now. Um, they have a ton of great resources, videos, YouTube channel stuff. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, if you find yourself able to travel or once the border opens up and you can get up to Toronto, just go to True for a day. You know, you take a whole day there even. Um, and talk to the people there, look at some of the equipment and, and look at their videos and see what the different options are for what, again, after some practice and things, you know, getting involved and what you might want to sort of work towards. Um, the other one, uh, other big company that seems to be really 
crazy growing now. Oh, that's already put in there. Okay, yeah, it is Ursa. It's the first link. Um, uh, Simon and so the Ursa folks, it's a UK company. Uh, they started designing these uh, these uh, great straps, which I have a bunch of. Um, and uh, a couple other companies now, they're kind of evolving uh, how people hide microphones and the packs are getting smaller, which by the way, I can probably show you what I'm wearing right now. It's a ZMT. Um, now I'm a jolly obese fellow, but these things are darn small no matter what. Um, so uh, uh, they're getting smaller and smaller. Um, the Zaxcom ones actually have a backup recorder in them. You can see the time code running right there and it's all synced up. So if I have to re-record the stuff, I have a backup if I go out of range, it's great. Um, but uh, as far as putting these on people's ankles, hiding them, putting you know the right kind of fabric and putting tape and all this other stuff. Uh, Ursa's kind of cornered that market and they're super cool and they have a lot of great videos, specifically uh, the, the link that I put in there. Uh, they have great interviews with uh, industry mixers that'll get a little more deep dive into some of the gear. Uh, and uh, uh, Amanda Beggs, the most recent one in LA, one's fantastic. She did Lady Bird uh, and a couple other um, uh, movies, more recent movies to kind of deep dive into. Um, uh, you know, honestly, some people, some mixers uh, are a little more aloof, um, hard to get a hold of, uh, not really keen on opening up and talking. Uh, I think maybe because of that, I've been a lot, a lot more open and, and try to invite into some of this, but so a lot of them are great, um, which kind of gets to my last point uh, for career building. If you see something you really like, if you watch a TV show, watch a, uh, anything that may have been done locally or even just a, a series or something, there is absolutely nothing stopping you from looking in those credits and looking up the person who did it, uh, finding out how they did it, get the script to that movie. Find, you know, and start to make the, connect those dots like we were talking about with like, how many people are talking? Where was this, you know, what's the scene take place? What's the dialogue like? How did the, you know, how did they get from there to what I saw? Um, and even going so far as to emailing or looking up those companies or those people, not just with sound department, uh, where that stuff came from uh, and how to uh, maybe email them if they have a public address or a website or a company say like, hey, just like with people like Adam and me or, or, or Pepe, like, I, I like your stuff. I want to know more about it. You know, can, can I have, you know, you know, if I ask you questions about it, are you free or, um, you know, uh, you know, how did you do this specifically? You know, people, everybody loves talking about themselves or, you know, how they do. And especially with, with something like sound where uh, we're literally a department that is heard and not seen. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, it's uh, to, to, to be kind of plucked and prodded and say like, oh, you matter, what you did, I like what you did, can you talk about it? That happens so rarely with a lot of departments. Um, so you, you might, and I, just, I, my, I myself personally benefited from it. Um, contacting something, you're seeing something you liked and, and talking about it, asking questions. Um, that's, that's what's a great way to get um, to get so not just uh, some advice, but you know, potential ideas of how to, to move forward uh, and what might be interesting. You might get the right kind of feedback um, or possibly opportunities down the road, depending on what you're, you know, where you are locale wise and get what you're getting into. Um, speaking of which, there's, there's another thing about how I ended up in New York City um, and, and where, you know, at least what a lot of people end up doing this for a living. Um, you know, uh, obviously, um, I'll still work, and I did last year at A Quiet Place 2, um, which was a fluke how I even ended up doing it in the first place, because it was a sequel. Uh, it, was, it was just through uh, <laughs> more just chance circumstance than anything else um, um, that I ended up working on it. Uh, but um, I've been in New York City now for a couple of years, but before that, I was taking... Uh, any kind of jobs that I felt would, would, was right for me, I could vet and I could ask friends about or something that would be down here or somewhere in a bigger market where I can make some good networking. Um, and eventually it wasn't until the point where I knew that I could sustain myself uh, and I could work longer jobs and I could get those longer gigs and end up working, being able to work as a local. Um, uh, that, that was sort of my window, and that's, that's hopefully, potentially after COVID, that may not be the case anymore, which, which would be fantastic. You can go and be in Buffalo or Syracuse uh, and, or in that region and kind of, you know, help, just only need to work to sustain yourself in those places. Um, but until then, 
Uh, there is absolutely nothing wrong with you taking a step, taking an opportunity somewhere else. If you know you're getting paid, if it, if it works out financially for you, put yourself up somewhere um, where the job is. If it's the if it's the choice between you getting a job and somebody else, whether you're local or not. Uh, I mean, I know over the years, I know that Adam is going to raise an eyebrow to you because I would lived in Rochester and he's Buffalo. Um, but you know, the, there, there is a lot to do. There, there's a lot to be said about people that know the region and know the people and know the area. Um, uh, but that, that only does only go so far. And if you're positive and you're, you're reaching out to people and you're helpful and you, and you're not undercutting each other and you're not necessarily, um, you know, price fixing or, or, you know, consorting, but you're also, but you're, you know, you have a generally positive attitude about it. You know, that people, you know, there is competition for work, but, um, you know, there are things that if, if they want you, but the only thing prohibiting you is whether you're there or not, you can decide for yourself if that's right, if that's, if that's worth your time. Uh, same thing goes with gear. Like you buy a bunch of gear and like, I don't know if this is right, but I'm going to make this time investment. Give yourself a time limit. Give yourself a, a, a you know, a period of time where you're going to, I'm going to throw myself into this. And if I, if I'm not happy with it by the end of this, you know, six months or a year, ask you know, people like Adam and me for advice on, on where to go with, with your career in this, if that's not working, um, then you, then you reassess. Um, but if you, if you prohibit yourself based on, you know, well, I don't think I could make it or I don't think I could get that job. And, and if you don't allow yourself to even apply, uh, you don't know if it's, it's going to work. Uh, was that the miss the, the, the hits you don't take or something like that. I'm really bad with those, <laughs> those things. Um, uh, but that, that's, that's kind of the best piece of it. And that's kind of how I ended up here. But again, for me personally, um, that's, that was never really my intention for the rest of my life. I mean, if that's how it works out, great. And uh, that's kind of another attitude thing about, about, the, about having a career in film is that if you, if you limit yourself too much, um, you know, uh, or if, you, if you're too, uh, you know, uh, tunnel visioned as far as what exactly you want to do, you might end up precluding yourself from things that you might find you benefit from later down the road. I mean, yeah, I've done a ton of great indie mixing things and I still hope to do those. But if, again, like I said before, I can't complain if I end up just utilitying these great shows for, for the rest of my career because it's, it's good work. And I know that I'm helping and I'm talking to people and I'm maybe going back and helping, you know, people in the comedian places I like. Hopefully for me, in the next few years, I want to get to the point where I can go and and be based in Western New York again and be able to, you know, increase union membership and, and help people, you know, build careers and, and, and help bring series and long form things there where the studios and brands can trust that they, that people up there, you know, can have sustained careers and then I have to worry about doing stuff in other, in other places. And that's how, you know, that's how we got things like Atlanta and Vancouver is is not just by the opportunities, but by having the, the sustainable work play, work workforce and people that have a, a sort of revolving door of, of expertise and, uh, you know, a turnaround of, uh, or turnover of, uh, you know, uh, opportunity and, and people and, and knowledge base and, and the brain of all the work pe force and people there. So that's, that's sort of the, the biggest picture thing about like the whole industry and how, how I got to where I am and where I hope and hopefully for the rest of the community and anybody watching this, where things can go. Um, and at least how I've seen that whole journey um, and, and where it might lead. Uh, so that's, that's pretty much the extent of my talk here. I'm going to drop a couple of other things here. Um, some of the things we, we've already talked about. Um, uh, some of the specific uh, devices, things that just to kind of look forward to, especially if you're looking at uh, being a solo person down the road. I'm going to do my very brief Zaxcom pitch, uh, which is the the Nova uh, recorder. Um, but there's uh, just a, again, there's a lot of different options. There's a lot of different companies. Um, Adam's got, you know, his own uh, things, but for, for narrative scripted stuff, uh, there's a, a set of uh, very common things I keep seeing over and over again. Um, and again, having more knowledge is never, <laughs> never bad. Uh, having more familiarity is never bad. Uh, not saying anyone needs to go and buy any of this stuff, but like looking on their brand websites or the forums 
or looking at the manuals and seeing how some of this stuff works is a, is a big part of the job and knowing how to maintain it or coordinate it so you can show up on any given set and be able to make it work. Um, if you're a, if you're a solo person, I, I, I um, and again, I'm a Zach Thompson, so take that what it is. Uh, the, the Nova's kind of really kind of hit the stride now because they have uh, a recorder and not just with the backups and the other fun time code sinky stuff that Zach Thompson does, but it also has the wireless receivers built into the recorder. Uh, so you can have up to eight channels, uh, including that mix track um, with wireless, with a wireless boom or just, you know, cabled stuff. You can, you can run all those wireless stuff together. Um, I did leave out WYSIWYGOM. Uh, <laughs> uh, WYSIWYGOM, I think, that, that may be kind of like Audio Limited. I think they're still in a sort of transitional thing. But I also left out Sure Axiom. Um, I, I, I think, uh, you know, there's, there's still some branding stuff in play with the different uh, manufacturers. I don't know if, if – has Sound Devices fully bought out – are they buying out Audio Limited or the same company now? Adam, I know this. They have owned Audio Limited for a few years now. Okay, yeah, um, but uh, but yeah, there's I mean there's um, uh, th that's just the stuff that I've seen on the series and and network stuff that I've done uh, and the the ma majors and tier job indies. Um, there's there are a few people that have whizzies where they're less common, um, but that would be the the close fourth. Um, uh, just like on the on the on the recording devices. Um, um, you know, like, uh, like the Sonosax recorders would probably be like a close fourth, um, and Sonosax boards in general, um, or the seven series, six series, people still use those sound device recorders and they're great. Um, uh, yes. Uh, so that's, uh, that's pretty much all the info I can kind of spew. Um, any other, have any fun stories, anything else? Uh, don't ask me about for that for that actor question if you don't mind yeah yeah of course uh i, I two tips for actors I, I thought that was a great question um one make friends with the sound mixer because <laughs> you can get the feedback on how your voice sounds which uh, a lot of people don't necessarily think about but it's kind of more important than how you look is how you sound <laughs> If, uh, if the sound mixer is your friend, um, you have that conversation all day long, it, it can be very fruitful for both of you. Uh, the second thing is, is, especially around here where a lot of screen actors tend to do stage more than they do screen, uh, I always have this talk the first day with, with uh, stage actors that I know just came off a of play. Um, there's no nosebleed seats. You've got a mic here. Uh, you've got a mic here. If you whisper, I can hear you. Uh, you do not need to project like you would when you're on stage. Just talk normally. If, if, it's, if it's wrong, the director will tell you, but uh, default to your normal voice, not your stage voice. So that's my two cents for actors. No, that's, that's absolutely, that's incredible. Thank you. Um, there is, there's, there's a guy, so the, the, the job that I was on before and then after COVID was an Apple TV job. It's a sci-fi thing. It's not out yet, um, but uh, there's it's a multi-faceted, multicultural story um, with a lot of technical jargon, and it's it's, it's goes like it's like I'm saying, like it goes from those big, you know, theatrical esque scenes where people are yelling at each other, like you would have normally a stage actor, uh, borderline yelling at each other, but it also has a lot of intense, quiet stuff and some newer people, and there's a lot of background. Um, but uh, the there was a person that we had the entire run of the show it was just a dialect coach um, that deals with s some of the things about, you know, levels and projection um, and uh, situational dialogue and things, but also uh, just the dialect in general, like how they pronounce things, how their cadence comes out. Does it sound, is it audible? You know, having somebody, whether it's a professional or not, uh, you know, it's just sort of like ask, ask a sound mixer, you know, how does this sound? Uh, you know, how does this coming out? How does my voice sound? How can I work on my, my diction? Um, you know, if I, if I wanted to put on my radio voice and talk to everybody like that, um, you know, how can I, how can I change that for certain situations? Um, or if I'm going to be doing, uh, you know, talking like I talk like the rest of my family, this is by the way, how the rest of my family kind of talks. Um, you know, how can I uh, learn to get in that kind of character? 
So uh, this is just one of the kind of many things you can do, just talking with a, with a, a sound oriented person or a dialogue coach or somebody uh, that can help kind of improve your game and, and make you a more effective actor on set. Uh, Crystal, <laughs> explain how actors can be like human furniture. Um, yeah, so uh, a lot of times, you know, you, well, let's, let's say you capture a scene, like we're, we're, we're talking about that, uh, um, like the, the succession succession scene, right? So you shoot this big wide master, you let everybody play in the space how they would, they're all wired up uh, and it just kind of goes au natural and then what happens. But um, once, you, once, you, once you have that in general, um, you're obviously, for most of these scenes, those are kind of not really that one because we already got it, um, but you're gonna want to get coverage. You're gonna want to get sort of angles and looks and, and, and positions. So, um, you know, not everybody's going to get their coverage at the same time. And, uh, you know, it's, sometimes it's really dramatic stuff you're going to be asked to do many, many times. Uh, so uh, being able to know, like, finding your light and, like, knowing your positioning and your blocking and hitting your marks all the time, um, having, building that kind of consistency and knowing that that's as big of a part as the actual performance and then that being able to facilitate the performance for other people, being that sort of, uh, yeah, this, the, the, uh, that consistent thing, and it's a human furniture, but like that thing that's reliably the same thing every time for everybody else because they know they have to do it a lot of different ways. You know, delivering that line in the same cadence with the same, you know, pauses uh, so they can, uh, they can have that consistency when it's somebody else's angle or when it's some other thing where, you know, you're, you're just barely on the side of the frame or you're, you're only looking this way. So they have that consistency for the edit or for the sound or for the, for the, for the, for the DP. So they can have that matching when they want to cut around. That's kind of what we're talking about when it comes to, to being, uh, you know, human furniture. Um, but it's one more actor thing. Yeah. Uh, know the difference between a wide and somebody else's close up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, it's not always your time. <laughs> yeah, uh, and especially with regard to overlap, and and yeah. I catch this for directors all the time because a lot of times they're they're so wrapped up in in the nuance of the performance they they miss some of the technicals. Um, when you are in a wide shot where everybody can be seen at once, you can overlap, you can cut each other off as much as you want. When you are in a single where it's just on one person, you cannot cut off another person or it becomes impossible to edit and that I, I think can be hard for actors to grasp because they're not always technical and they're not always thinking about what's going to happen in the edit they're thinking about how do I deliver these lines best and how does the conversation flow best well sometimes what seems to flow best in the moment is not what's going to flow best on the cutting room floor so let it breathe when you're in a close-up whether it's on you or on the other person just don't cut anybody off or you're going to get yelled at by the sound mixer and the director. No, that's, that's excellent. I mean, we're talking about those, those these different scenes, like how do we do something like, like that like succession bit where everybody's talking once, well, we just wired everybody and then they cover what they cover uh, or the, the clover thing where it's a natural thing. Where we just kind of have to live with it. You know, that, that sort of overlap is just built in and we try and capture everything. And then they just kind of hope and pray a little bit in the edit. Um, uh, but when it when it comes to specific coverage for each person, yes, exactly. Um, uh, you know, if, if you're uh, it's, it's for let's say further and that we have further reading, there's there's further watching. Probably one of the best examples from the past year. If you haven't seen it yet, uh, watch Uncut Gems. Um, not just because a friend of mine mixed it, uh, it was Anton um, who does who did Last OG, uh, but because. Uh, the one of the co-directors, one of the brothers, was the boom operator, uh, and he also designed. Who's a sound designer, supervisor for that film, helped with a lot of the score, um, and they went out of their way specifically to make the overlapping, the arguments, the things so intense uh, and real feeling that it, it becomes an intrinsic part of the the cinematography like you were locked into those shots and those interactions how they're shot because because you're allowing these people to overlap so much um you know when they when they when they cut to somebody they know they have to know exactly how they got there in, in you know beforehand in the edit uh to capture it correctly and when they can and can't cut away to somebody else uh that kind of forethought from sound is 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 very rarely seen 
Um, but if you, as you gain experience as a mixer, you can have, start to have those discussions between that and a DP and a director as it starts to play out based on how a scene is rehearsed and how you want to end up shooting it. Um, but that's, that's a very rare case because the director was the boom op where they, yeah, they, maybe they got a, everything that they wanted for the sound, uh, which is also pretty rare. Um, but what they did get is, is to me is astounding. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, great. Thanks, Adam, again. Um, ask a wireless question. Yes, Christy, please come on in. Hey, Mom. Hi. Hi. Um, thanks for doing this. This is really awesome. Uh, yeah. yeah, I just have a question. So I took a filmmaking class and my teacher, um, I'm sorry I'm gonna, if I get the terminology wrong, but my teacher did not recommend getting a wireless mic, you know, that would transmit sound to another, you know, like a board or whatever, because he said he used one and he picked up sounds within the building. He said he he heard, you know, on his, um, yeah, his sound recordings, he heard like conversations, he heard like a Britney Spears song. So he said, you know, don't, don't buy those wireless ones, you know, that transmit to something. So my actors, you know, I just got to zoom like my actors have to keep this clunker in their back pocket because they're wired in. Um, so I was just wondering, you know, for me, professional, like, do you think he bought a cheap microphone or do you think that it was some kind of setting that he just messed up that picked um, up a sound? Yes. Helpful? So uh, how long ago was this? Can I ask? Uh, like a year when he did it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like a, a year or two ago. Okay. Because all right. So, I would say, yeah. okay. So we're, in, we're in the digital realm. So uh, back yeah. way back in the analog days. Yes. If you had something that was un shielded or unprotected any audio cable just like in the old days your kid maybe you, you heard something in radio or something kind of fuzzed in somewhere in that or or uh you heard maybe uh um you're listening to your headphones and something you kind of hear like radio kind of interfere sometimes yeah. well that basically all comes from unbalanced or unshielded wiring because yeah. a copper wire is literally just an antenna uh if it's not protected properly uh or if it's not set up properly um, you will get some kinds of interference. It's a lot less likely now, um, but so that's that's one of two things that may have happened. Okay. Um, the other is they may have just gotten some piece of technology that was not designed properly. Yeah, uh, it's, <laughs> yeah. Um, cheap. yeah, and again, cheap doesn't necessarily mean uh, broken. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of companies and things that can make something reliable. Um, but again, you know, if, if you're thinking of getting something, you know, asking the forms, ask a board, you know, call up one of those companies and say like, Hey, I have this much money. What, you know, what's not going to ruin my day. It's going to work for somebody. Um, you know, the, 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 the zoom recorders are not terrible. Um, you know, the, the, the logistical problem with those, uh, is really kind of after the fact and, you know, the, nobody's actually listening to what's going into those recorders. So you just kind of, you know, hope and pray yeah. you, know, you hook up maybe a wire to them and just goes into the recorder. You, you know, you set it and forget it, the Ron Popeil style. Um, hmm. uh, but it's, it's, it's an option. Um, if you, uh, uh, again, if you can find a, if you can find a way to make that somebody's job, whether it's a super cheap, you know, uh, off-branded or you know, reboxed something, or it's a super old, you know, uh, or used maybe out of discontinued, but definitely still viable piece of equipment. Um, and you can have somebody monitor it. That's, you know, that'll do the job. Cool. Yeah. And you obviously recommend wireless over being tethered. Uh, well, again, it can, it depends on, on your application. So what is, what is this you're, you're using it for mostly? Is this Mostly just short films. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, if you know uh, that you you are always working with uh, somebody shooting in small spaces, uh, or you know that you 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 you're never going to have you know uh, more than two people, but you're never going to have a boom operator or somebody that can move a, a physical mic in the space, or if you're going to be in such, you know, realistic, very situations where, you know, you're going to have too many hard lights. You don't have a gaffer to soften everything up, you know, to make it so you can swing mics around the room. Um, then yeah, uh, you know, having a couple of wireless mics might be your only option to, to get something really consistent all the time. Um, uh, the question is, uh, you know, do you, if you don't have the money for a, a sound person, or to rent from somebody or to rent somebody for that day, 
um, or that, that project, you know, if you're just going to have to go into the camera, how do you deal with that? Well, um, you know, you're going to have to think about, again, what's, what's on paper. Can I do this with what I have? Mm -hmm. uh, the, you, know, you can do a lot with just, uh, you know, the, the two channels going into your camera, mm -hmm. but there's limitations. You, know, you might need a, an external mixer that has, you know, three or four channels or something that just sits under your camera that, you know, you can put, uh, a few different channels and a, a, a zoom a H6 or something like that. And uh, you don't have to write the individual ones, but you know, it's just something, <laughs> you know, something else that gives you a, a, a stage of monitoring and allows for more, maybe more channels or, you know, allows you to, to kind of monitor that, you know, with, with some, some couple of wireless mics, you know, you're going to be using over and over. Yeah. Um, if I, um, yeah, go ahead, Adam, please. Yeah. Um, the wired versus wireless question. I, I don't. I don't mean a district teacher, but anytime anybody says this, this didn't work for me, so don't ever do it. Um, that's that's not necessarily advice you should take. Yeah, I was skeptical, and I, I love asking you guys who do this professionally. So thank you. Yeah, um, if, if that if that were a, a, a major unsolvable problem, we would not be able to make movies the way we do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, assuming we're talking about lav mics, um, if it's like a sit down interview, like right right now, we're all just a bunch of talking heads, and I'm just talking into my laptop mic, so I probably sound terrible. But Mike sounds good talking into his lav mic and his his um, boom mic there, which which are both wireless but he could just as easily be wired because he's just sitting there mm -hmm. when you're up and walking around that becomes a safety issue and yeah you don't you don't want people walking around tripping over cables as they're trying to act so in, in that case they they do if they're being live they do need to be wireless labs um, why did your teacher have those problems uh, it could be as mike surmised bad cabling bad transmitter or receiver or my guess is he probably just neglected to scan for a clean frequency first uh, most yeah, most of and what he probably neglected to scan for a clean frequency uh, but okay. didn't have other things on it before uh -huh. he began most of the wireless receivers will have built-in scanners you just push a button and it tells you what's open oh, okay. so if you're using a frequency that somebody else is already broadcasting on yeah, you, you're going to pick up that broadcast. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, again, when we talked, when Pepe, we were talking about just the, the uh, knowledge of the wireless spectrum in general, um, understanding that, you know, when you get, uh, you know, a, a wireless microphone or a wireless system, because it's a transmitter and receiver, um, you know, that system, it has to operate somewhere apart in the airspace. Um, and it's going to have a, a bunch of you know, numbers there that may not make sense to you. And that's okay. Not everybody has to know it. Um, but you got to know that you know, if you go from one town to another, or you go from one state, or even if you go from a house to outside the house, part of it might not work properly. Uh, you may have to need to kind of tweak a couple things based on, uh, let's say if you're in the UHS spectrum, which is right now the usable UHS spectrum, which is about 470 something to, to 608. Uh, megahertz. Um, you have to know where the other TV stations in your area, you're, I know you're in Connecticut, um, what parts of that spectrum are existing TV stations because they're still broadcasting in that space. Um, if you have, for example, a Sennheiser AVX uh, or a road link um, uh, or a, a deity system, um, those are going to operate either in the 1.9 megahertz or in the 2.4. Um, if you think, remember in the old days, uh, cell phones of the old Nextel would operate in 1.9. Um, uh, I think maybe upper 900, 1200, somewhere in there. Anyway, um, but that's pretty clean, but you get a little bit of delay. There's kind of trade-offs there. Uh, some of the stuff, a lot of stuff now are working in 2.4, which is 2.4 gigahertz is the same spectrum as Wi-Fi. So like I said, if, you, if you're using that outside in the middle of nowhere, uh, you go out to a field, it's gonna sound crystal clear. Obviously, there's nothing to compete with. You take that inside into an office building where you got somebody with a giant ubiquity system, or somebody blasting their own Wi-Fi bandwidth. It's, you're going to fight, you know. And, and if you're going from one room to another, and you got you know two brick walls in the way, it's going to be hell. 
but if you're going out somewhere, it might sound perfect. Uh, so it just, you know, again, running some of that by situationally, uh, for, uh, you know, before you invest in something, if you know exactly what your situations are going to be, like Adam said, you know, it's, 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 it's a lot easier to make that choice, but you know, the, the more universally applicable you want something to be, the chances are the more robust and costly that, that piece of equipment is going to be at the same time. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Anybody else in there has got any other uh, fun stories, horror stories, things not working for them? Um, I think, yep, I just ran out of batteries on my uh, receiver here. Oh, by the way, I'll, I'll show you guys. You need to listen. Uh, I'm using, a, it's also a Zaxcom. They have an IFB system um, that will... Uh, um, I'll use the same transmitters, but I'm going to a wireless receiver uh, that I can send time code to. These are the, the these are the 100s, by the way, Adam. Um, just pull three guys out here so I can listen. Um, but uh, yeah, that's another thing is is when you're when you're monitoring, how do you monitor? Um, you know, you might not have the resources to get a separate wireless set to go back out of your recorder. You know, you may be you may be stuck having to be tethered to a camera. That's another thing to kind of think about before you in step onto a set. And get this back in here, and I can actually hear everybody. All right, there we go. Thanks. Sorry about that. Um, and uh, maybe even having a utility that you know monitor battery levels and make sure that this what just happened doesn't happen. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, I don't know how much time you guys are all have here, but it is just about three o'clock. It was a great two hour chunk there. Anybody have anything else? Hannah, anybody? Robin, you jump in here. Any other notes from the uh, Purple Lotus Blossom Society? If nobody else has any other questions, I just want to say thank you so much. Mike and Adam and everybody yeah. else that also shared their knowledge and asked their questions. Um, this was super awesome. And we really appreciate everybody coming. And I put the link in above all the questions for crisis services. I'll drop it in again um, because we do yeah. run free of charge and we don't charge anything, but we do ask our speakers if they have a specific charity or organization of their choice. So I just dropped that back in the chat. Yeah. No, great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and, and, and briefly, if you're not familiar, obviously, you know, there's there's a lot of great things. Obviously, a lot of people in need, uh, you know, food banks and, and a lot of things going on right now, but especially with people stuck at home uh, and people worried about, um, you know, the ramifications of what kind of help they need and is it going to be confidential? I mean, the crisis services and a couple other charities, they, they do great work helping filter and direct people in the right places um, with addiction, with abuse, uh, with uh, hunger, with um, – uh, any kind of things that would be social services or beyond, um, or, or you know, in connecting people with with suicide prevention and 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 therapists and and other mental health services, it's just a great uh, kind of catch all that helps facilitate all these other things. Um, and personally, just aside from some of this, there's a lot of stuff that's sorely, I was, as we've seen now, a lot of stuff that's this attention that we saw were sorely missing is a sort of ability and people to outreach uh, and to, to get that kind of help and get people that are really compassionate and can listen. And they're a, a great group that does some of the facilitating for anybody. So uh, there, so there it is. Thanks. Thanks again, guys. <laughs>